So my name is Jason Walnowski. Uh, I'm, I guess, the, uh, one of the maintainers of the Cynthia project. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. And I just want to remind everyone, there's a link to the exercises. You can use that link and find this talk, or there's a, a bit.ly link there that you can follow. Um, I have a bunch of different exercises that you can go through that should basically teach you how to use um, Cynthia, how to get set up, and uh, different things you can go through to try to play with it. So uh, if I'm not necessarily going to walk through all of those exercises right here in this talk. Um, but there's some pretty easy step-by-step -step instructions that you can follow there. And I'll be around uh, for the rest of the conference. I'm happy to talk to people and answer questions and everything. So there's the exercises. Um, so Cynthia is a, uh, stands for Synthetic Health. Uh, it's a synthetic patient simulation. We uh, open source project simulates uh, patients from birth till death. It simulates the progression and treatment of disease. Uh, right now, there's over 30 different modules. It's over 540 clinical concepts. Uh, and the idea is uh, we output uh, health records. Um, and what we want to do is produce really high quality, synthetic, realistic, but not real, uh, synthetic records that you can use um, for any sort of non-clinical uh, secondary use without restrictions. So uh, there's, no, there's no legal, there's no costs, there's no privacy security restrictions, you're not hampered by HIPAA. You can use it for demoing, you can use it for public sandboxes. Um, basically any use where you, you, know, you don't necessarily, you're not trying to like machine learn um, clinical concepts is, uh, is open, open game. So why are we doing this? Um, well, there's a high demand for EHR data sets. Um, people want to use them for software development, uh, integration, testing, interoperability work. Um, but there's a lack of access of these data sets. I mean, if you work for specific providers, you may have access to these, but you, know, you can't really share this data. There's all sorts of data use agreements. Um, there's costs. You can, you can buy anonymized records. Um, but there's risks with that. Um, Real records, even if they're de-identified, have a lot of uh, legal um, issues with them. But also, uh, they're not really anonymous. There's like a whole uh, group of academic researchers out there who make it their job to basically point out the holes and, and de-identify data and, and re-identify records. They've made careers out of this, is, is, is actually figuring out who the records are and, 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 and shaming people in weird ways. Um, so, um, you know, they're not, even though they're de-identified, they're, they're not really anonymous. And internally, you know, we have a lot of open source software projects where we wanted data that we could use to work with people that wasn't restricted in any way and that would let pass giggle tests when you were doing a demo uh, to a doctor or clinicians or anything. You know, the demo wouldn't be derailed because um, you know, someone had a, a lab value that they would die from, for example. So you want realistic, really good data. So that's why we started the project. Um, the way sort of the project works is uh, we started by taking, um, we started with clinical care maps. And so a clinical care map is basically, uh, uh, they have lots of names. Sometimes they're called clinical practice guidelines. Sometimes it's called the standard of care, although I'm sure a lot of you are aware there's no such thing as a standard of care. But if we take a standard of care, sometimes we get these from uh, uh, peer-reviewed journals. Sometimes we get them from publications from medical specialty societies. And what we've done is we've turned these into state machines, more or less. And I'll show you what that looks like uh, later. And then we seed those with disease uh, incidence and prevalence statistics. Um, let's see if I can get my mouse over here. Uh, that we can get from places like the CDC or the NIH or other uh, peer-reviewed literatures. And we create these disease modules. So this is what drives the progression and treatment of care in the patients. Uh, we couple that with census demographics. So for us, uh, the system's preloaded um, with data in the United States. Some of the exercises show how you can adapt um, Cynthia for other countries or other regions. But um, 
The census demographics are all from the US Census Bureau, so we have basically every named place in the United States. Uh, we have all the demographics like age and, and race and ethnicity and gender and um, socioeconomic status, what's people's education, what's their income levels, all that kind of stuff. And you use that to seed a population. The next thing we do is we add uh, providers. So we have uh, CMS uh, has a, a public data set or has actually several public data sets where they list all the providers that get uh, reimbursements from the government. Um, and so we can see that. So we have all the hospitals, we have dialysis centers, we have all that kind of stuff that we now, so we have these real provider organizations um, in the population. And then we take uh, cost data. So this is uh, relative value units and, and geographic price cost index so we can simulate the cost of things. So when we generate claims, there's costs associated with every encounter, with every procedure. Um, in the real world, costs vary super widely. So uh, you know they're not necessarily accurate, but um, at least the, the CMS sort of Medicare reimbursement rates is, is kind of the baseline. So anyway, then what happens is you generate this synthetic population. And I'll show you sort of what this looks like. But you have these state machines, and you just crank it on a time step basis. And you basically simulate these people from the day they're born until the day they die, or up to the present day, if they're still alive, then at the end of the thing, you export them as a, uh, as a set of data. And you can output different formats. But we're here for fire dev days, so um, you output fire um, for whatever use case you have. The other thing is not just patient records. So there's all sorts of statistics that get pumped out at the end of this thing that you can use for interesting sort of things if you want to. So for example, you can look at access to care. You can look at, since we have different facilities, you can figure out what the utilization is for these different facilities. And you can sort of calculate an individual's access um, and, and basically like how many encounters did they have. Um, uh, you know, how many times did they get this lab done? Um, you can also look at health outcomes. So we calculate the quality adjusted life years and the disability adjusted life years from the global burden of disease. And so everyone has basically, uh, as they progress, you can see how uh, the, basically everyone's quality of life changes. All right, so we, like I was saying, uh, all the quality data and then costs and price. So again, because we output claims and costs, and in fact, there's different insurance. We, we, we uh, simulate uh, Medicaid, Medicare, there's dual eligibles. People have private insurance or no insurance. So you can actually see where all these costs are going. That may or may not be interesting to you for your use case. Um, you can also look at what are individuals' costs. Uh, we're getting to the point where we're gonna, we'll have families, so you can look at family burden. And so it may be interesting to look at you know, how long does it take for someone to go bankrupt before they can't pay their uh, medical costs, at least here in the US. Anyway, you guys don't have that problem, perhaps, uh, in Europe. Um, so this is where we started with our diseases. It's uh, what I call the two top tens. So we started off, we want to just have a good coverage for people uh, for the different use cases folks had. So, uh, the top 10 reasons patients visit their uh, primary care physician. So it's things like routine health check, uh, hypertension, diabetes, pregnancy, uh, all sorts of respiratory stuff, uh, for ear infections. That's a big one with kids. Um, and then the top 10 years of life lost. This is another measure from the global burden of disease. So this is like all your chronic conditions that you know um, people suffer with and die from. So ischemic heart disease, lung cancer, Alzheimer's. At this point, we have. Um, I think 35 different disease tracks now, uh, but this is where we started. So there's a pretty good coverage of, of different um, um, clinical areas that you may be interested um, for your demos or for testing, and this is a lot of different corner cases of, of things that happen. So I mentioned that the disease modules um, are state machines, so they look kind of like this. I'll get a little bit more into it, but basically you have um, different states and the, and the patient will basically flow through these and it will end up getting created the record. So this is a visualization of the state machine, but they're written in JSON. So um, you can see that there's different, I bolded these, this is the initial state and each of the state names and then there's different information. You don't necessarily need to write JSON though because we have a nice little editor um, if you wanted to play around with the different disease modules. But basically, there's two types of states. One is uh, control state. So this basically controls 
what happens to a patient and where they sort of go through uh, the, the system. So there's things like an initial state. So everyone starts an initial state. There's a terminal state. So terminal state uh, does not mean they're dead. Terminal state means the module, that particular module ends. There's also things like delay state. Uh, there's things like um, a guard, which basically waits until something happens. There's ways to set attributes on people. Um, and there's counters. So if you want to make sure certain things happen, like, well, this has to happen exactly three times or you know, whatever, you can, you can have different ways to control the flow of what happens. And then there's um, these clinical states, and it's happening again. Great. This is painful. I'll just, it's, it's a new Mac. I blame MacBook and USB-C. USB-C is the worst thing. All right. So the clinical states, these desi uh, drive the, the care. So there's things like you can have symptoms. Oh, that was interesting. Uh, you can have symptoms. And so symptoms drive your care. Uh, so if what happens if a patient has accumulates symptoms, they're going to be like, man, I need to go to the doctor. And they'll go to the doctor. Um, you can have things like uh, medication orders. So that you know, in fire, that's a prescription. Uh, you can have procedures, observations. You can have care plans. There's all sorts of things. This is the kind of stuff that gets added uh, to your record. Uh, so at this point, I want to show you uh, in a walkthrough of a module called Examplitis. So Examplitis, it's sort of my, it's my demo condition because it's simple and people don't try to call me on its clinical accuracy. Um, so Examplitis is a painful condition that only affects males and most patients can be cured either with Examplitol or an exampleotomy that some never recover and they die. So let me bring, yeah, so let me bring you over to, uh, so here's my exercises, but uh, let me bring you over to, uh, to exampleitis. So this is, a, this is uh, the, the module builder, it's on GitHub, you can access this, you can, uh, you can load modules. These are all the modules that we have in here for all the diseases we have. Um, but it starts off when you go to the, with examplitis. I will, yeah. I'll try to. Uh, here we go. So you start out at the initial state. And what's going to happen is if you're a man, you're eligible for examplitis because I said it only affects males. If you're not, what happens is it goes out and it will go to the terminal state down at the bottom and it'll exit. But if you're a male, we'll say, you know, John Doe, what happens is you go to this next state. It's an age guard. So this is a guard state. And what it does is uh, it basically waits until John, you know, he started at the initial state as a baby, newborn. He goes to the, the age guard state and he just sits there. He just waits for 40 years. Oh, come on. This is the worst presentation I've ever given. <laughs> Does anyone have a different adapter? Yeah, I'll give it a shot. Oh, it's back for now. I'll hang on to it though in case I need it. Um, so he waits until he, he's, uh, he's uh, 40 years old. At that point, 10% of the population is going to get examplitis. The other 90% will exit, so I won't show that. So sadly, John Doe, he goes into this pre-examplitis state, and it's delay. And there's a range here um, where it's a little hard to see, but you can put in a range, and it shows you right here, 0 to 10 years. So basically, at this point, the simulation rolls the dice, and it says, how long is it going to wait before um, John Doe gets examplitis? Let's just say it rolls a five. So you know, John Doe is now 45 years old. And at that point, condition onset, examplitis. So now he has examplitis. He hasn't gone to the doctor yet, though. So he hasn't actually been diagnosed with it, but he has it. So um, you can enter a SNOMED code. Obviously, one, two, three is not a real. 
uh, SNOMED code, but now he has it. So then there's this state wellness encounter. So there's different types of encounters uh, in the system. So there's emergency encounters, there's urgent care, there's different types of encounters that can happen. A wellness counter is basically like your regular scheduled checkup. So what we're saying in this module is we wait until his next regular scheduled checkup. When he goes, the doctor's gonna talk to him and he's gonna be like, you've got exampleitis. So at that point, he's gonna prescribe him exampletol. So this is a medication order. In fire, you can give it an Rx norm code. And then we get to something interesting because this is a distrib uh, another distributed transition where we can determine, we can say, well, you know, based on probabilities, what might happen to this person? So 20% uh, or 10% of the people will go to the state called last days. Basically, there's nothing that can be done. They have terminal exampleitis. And sometime between eight and 20 years, they are going to die. But that's not what's gonna happen to John Doe. John Doe is gonna be like, well, and it's not gonna cure him either. They're gonna be like, well, the example at all didn't work, so we're gonna to have to perform an exampleotomy on you. So this is another delay state. It's, it rolls the dice between 18 and 36 months. This is the sort of right now to simulate uh, the fact that, you know, that they have to get all the, um, uh, you know, there's a delay in the procedure for whatever reason. It's not availability or there's no surgeon availability. We, we, we haven't added the uh, sort of like scheduling yet in FHIR, so there's a whole bunch of scheduling resources. It doesn't exist at the moment, so there's a random delay you know, where John Doe tries to get his example out scheduled. He has another encounter. This is an example automy encounter where there's a procedure where he has an example automy. There's a duration. The example automy is going to take two to three hours for that to happen. And at the end, there's an end encounter, and the encounter is over. Still at that point, he still might die, but we'll say that the example automy saved him, and there's the terminal state. So that's sort of how it works is where there's a whole bunch of delays, guards, there's, there's distributions, and basically these patients start an initial state and they go to a terminal state or they die along the way. And some of these have more or less clinical accuracy than others. We're not necessarily trying to simulate organs or uh, you know, some of these, uh, but it's, it's, this is sort of how uh, the disease progression and treatment will look in sort of uh, uh, from a, uh, maybe a workflow perspective or the health record perspective. And you can look at some uh, different ones of these. Um, for example, if um, I said some of them are more or less complicated. So, you know, um, diabetes, if you're looking for it, because people always ask me, it's not under diabetes, it's under metabolic syndrome. And actually there's two, so it's really complicated because there's a standard of care and there's disease progression. But you can look at things like lung cancer, where it's, there's a lot of stuff going on because the treatment of lung cancer is very complicated. Um, you can look at things uh, like, uh, let's see, what else is interesting? There's a lot of interesting stuff. Um, maybe op opioid addiction, that's a big thing right now. So there's an opioid addiction model, so some percentage of the people uh, are addicted to opioids, and that can happen either through um, directed use, where then they transfer to misuse and they start becoming addicts. Uh, it could happen from illegal use, but there's a lot of different modules that actually can prescribe opioids for pain for different reasons, and those people can actually all filter in down into this module where they can get into the path of addiction. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of content in here that you can change and look at and, and see. If you don't care, uh, that's fine, you can just use the tool um, to generate um, a module or to generate some, some, some records. So at this point, what am I doing for time? Not bad. All right, so at this point, I'm gonna show you maybe what some of the, the exercises go through. So if you want to, um, you know, if you're an adventurous hacker and you want to start messing around with stuff, you can do this on the fly um, right now, but to set up, it's pretty easy. You need Java 1.8. Uh, it's also, we've tested it on 1.9. Um, if you're into, if you're way advanced and you're into uh, Java 1.10, um, I've had issues. I haven't really looked to solve that yet, but um, if, you're, if you're a good Java developer, maybe you can figure it out. And you need Git. 
So all you have to do is clone the repository, you change into it, you run Gradle. Gradle is a build tool. It also does dependency management. It will download some of the libraries that we use, like the Happy Fire library for the models and, and some others, and it will basically um, build. So it's, it's pretty easy. Um, to generate data, uh, all you have to do is run a command that says run Cynthia. There's a bunch of different command line arguments, um, things like we can tell how many people you want. You can tell it where you want it to run. You can just name a place, like you would say Juno, Alaska, and we'll start running stuff for Juno, Alaska. You could tell it if you will, you could say, oh, I only want to generate men. Or you could say, I only want to generate uh, children from age uh, two to seven. So you can give it different command line parameters to tell it like what you're looking for. Um, one of the things you can't do, though, on the command line is specify something like, and I get this question all the time, is only generate me a population of people who have lung cancer. Can't do that right now. So if that's your question, I've just answered it. Um, so what happens is it, by, uh, it loads all the modules and we'll start producing people. And it gives you this little list of um, you know, who it's generated. It gives you a name, sort of gives you their age and where they're living. Um, so for Fire, we have a bunch of different output types. But we're here at Fire Dev Days. So what do we output in Fire? So we have bundle. Every patient record is in a, a complete bundle that you can use for um, transactions, for example. It contains a patient, a single patient. It contains all their encounters, uh, their conditions, their allergy intolerances, observations, diagnostic reports. So their you know, lipid panels and other labs will be in there. Uh, different procedures, whether those are diagnostic or surgical. Uh, imaging studies. Um, so when people have like an MRI or something like that, it'll go into imaging study. Uh, immunization, so all their vaccines. We have pretty complicated logic in there to make sure that people get vaccine, the right types of vaccines in the right years, and you can't get vaccines before they were invented and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, care plans, so certain disease modules will give people care plans that there's, you know, they adhere to. Um, and medication request is where we have um, our prescriptions. So there's other resources, and FIRE, obviously, there's like, 40 or 50 these days, it keeps growing. We don't produce them all. Uh, we also don't uh, support, uh, I don't think we support all of the Argonaut resources, uh, which is something that we're, is on the roadmap to do. So this is what you get out of the box though today right now. And then this is an example of, a, of an observation that gets generated. It's just a simple uh, blood pressure. It has um, you know, the systolic and diastolic components and you can see how it looks there. It, it, that's a sort of standard um, fire blood pressure. So after you run it and you ran that patient, um, or if you run Cynthia and you generate a patient, uh, what do you want to do with it? Well, you could post it to a fire server. That's one thing you could do. Uh, so this is just a curl command where I'm pointing it at the public instance of happy. And you can say, hey, uh, curl, I want you to post this URL. Tell it that I'm using um, fire JSON as my MIME type. Fire has this special application, FireJSON MIME type. You give it the file, and basically it's going to respond and say, yep, uh, thanks, your patient was created. And um, the, the, the response may be bigger or shorter than this, depending on what's in that uh, bundle. But um, basically, you can start posting these bundles to a Fire server immediately. And then you can, if, you know, if you want to stand up your own Fire server for playing, um, or um, development, you can just start loading this stuff right away if it doesn't have some type of import uh, feature. So for Fire, there's also some configuration settings. So uh, you can actually export uh, right now S2.3 and DS2.2. We don't, we're, we will move to R4, but we have not done that yet. But so by default, the Fire exports is S2.3, and you can see that um, there, that the exporter for fire is, is set to true. By the way, this is an abridged properties file. If you look at the properties, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there you can mess with. But um, there's, there's a new parameter in here for a transaction bundle that's set to true, which is the default. It produces a transaction bundle. And if it's set to false, it produces what's called a collection bundle. So if you're really into figuring out the different types of bundles, there's actually two different types. So transactions are meant for you to post as a transaction to a server, and a collection is not. 
Um, so by default, it produces transaction bundles. We have some um, profiles that we add. Um, because we produce um, things like uh, we produce driver's licenses and, and social security numbers and passports and identifiers and all this sort of extra information that isn't um, in the, by default in Fire. We produce uh, extensions that we can add. And, and if you want, you can, those are on by default, but you can turn them off, where all these different types of extensions will get outputted into the patient as well. You can, you can have, you can turn on STU2, so your output, you can S output STU2 and the, uh, the STU3 resources simultaneously um, if you want to, so you could turn that on. And then there's these other ones for specifically for um, hospitals. So um, at, when you produce uh, a bunch of patients, say you run, you run for 10, pa 10 patients, you'll have 10 bundles, one for each patient. If you have these hospital exporters also on, then it will produce an 11th bundle, which contains all the information about all the providing organizations in the system, as, long, as well as statistics on like, well, this is how many encounters were here. This is how many procedures happened at this hospital. Um, this is how many patients they saw and all that stuff, um, where you can sort of see that information. So those are our standard sort of fire configuration settings. You can mess around with those. Uh, to get different behavior. So um, one thing you might be asking is, uh, how are other people using Cynthia? Why, you know, who's, who's using this? That's a question I get asked a lot. So I found some examples here. Um, I, I'm aware of lots of people using it, but these are the ones that people have publicly have used it, so I'm going to talk about those. So HSPC has um, fire sandboxes available. I'm not sure if people have used those or not. But one of the things you can go is you can go to their, um, their sandbox. And what you can do is you, if you sign up for an account, you can click on this button. And you can spin up your own fire. Uh, it's, it's a happy-based fire server that you can spin up. And you can have it preloaded with Cynthia data. And so if you if you're just want to start hacking, you, but you want to write a client or an app, and you don't want to uh, create your own fire server, you can spin up a VM for free. And you can have it loaded with Cynthia data if you want. Um, Smart Health, uh, those guys have used um, the data. They have a, uh, in their documentation, they have a, a set of sandbox data that they generate for Cynthia that they make available for some of their um, smart server. Uh, they, have a, they have a dockerized version of Happy that's preloaded with Cynthia. And then they've used it for their bulk data. Um, so hi, Dan. Uh, so Dan has, runs a bulk data track where you know, they're looking at how can you uh, bulk data transfer fire resources. And um, they've used Cynthia data for that as well. So, and uh, let's see, uh, there's a company called Algorex Health where they've used the data because they want to, um, they, they're writing code to basically do open clinical analysis. So they wanted a data set that was uh, free from restrictions that they could play around with and they could publish and they could show people this is how you could do some clinical analysis. So they have a blog post, you can look at that there. Uh, we, view, we use it internally for a lot of our, we, my company, MITRE, we build a lot of open source health software. So we use it for uh, internal development. We also use it for a lot of our demos. We have a system um, out there uh, called Synthetic Mass, which is um, Synthetic State of Massachusetts. It's at 1 7th scale. It's actually an older version of Fire. It's version 1.8, but there's a million uh, patients out there that you can access and you can download the whole million records if you want to, uh, if you didn't feel like using the compute power to generate your own. Uh, Microsoft, there's a Microsoft blog post about um, how they were using Azure to, to load uh, Cynthia Fire data, and there's a whole bunch of others out there. You can, you can just find them if you Google, but there are people out there using it. Um, I just had a bunch of people today come up to me and say, oh yeah, we use this internally in our company. And so, um, uh, it is being used, it's free, um, and if it will help you in your development, then I encourage you to do it. The four tutorials that I've made available for you guys, um, I had the link at the beginning and I can put that up, is, is how do you install, configure, and run this thing? Uh, how do you use the fire data? Uh, how can you explore and play with the disease modules? I walked you through examplitis, but there's some step-by-step -step things in there about how you can play with it. And then the fourth one, and this is the big heavy lift, 
uh, is how you would localize this for alternative geographic locations. So if you want to make a synthetic Netherlands, or you want to make a synthetic uh, United Kingdom, or if you want to make synthetic Earth and you want to do global health, you know, what would all the stuff you'd have to do uh, to do that? So that's, that's more of an advanced one, but um, uh, it can be done. So, people ask me my roadmap. I actually just made this like an hour ago. <clears throat> and I thought it'd be clever and I would make a disease module for my roadmap. Um, so <laughs> the bullet point version is though, you know, we have fire DS2, 2, and 3 today. Uh, we're going to go to, I was waiting for R4 to become as stable or as normative as possible before I invested the energy in implementing it. Um, but R4, um, the other night I was, uh, I was mocked for not uh, producing uh, patients who adhere to certain profiles. Uh, so that's something else that we were looking at. And that's kind of a hard problem. It's, it's the idea of uh, you bring your profiles and implementation guides to Cynthia and you say, okay, you have all this data, you're gonna generate all this data, but when you output it, we want you to use the profiles that we give you. And that's hard because it's like, what do those profiles mean? And how do I know that what I'm generating aligns with the profile you have? But there may be some tricks that can be done to get that to work. So it's something I'm probably gonna try to think about. Uh, and then for Fire, another thing is sort of having the full support for all the different Argonaut resources, as well as um, some of the things that are uh, not just the basic data query in Argonaut, but some of the things that are um, after that. So I don't know if you've heard uh, Brett Marquard's talk um, earlier, but things like um, uh, scheduling and data provider and all that kind of stuff. Um, what else? So uh, right now, uh, when you run Cynthia, it actually will take, it will, like I said, it will run these patients from um, birth till death or from birth until present day. Um, but what happens if you want to have a system where you want to have sort of live updates of these things? Um, one of the things people asked us about synthetic mass is, well, well this is, is this a snapshot or does this update? Well, it's a snapshot, I'll t you know, spoiler. But people have asked for, well, can I have it so that my patients will update every day? So if I go back to my, you know, I'm, I have a smart app that I'm developing and I wanna go back to my smart app and I wanna see the patient updating. And we want all these patients updating. And it's like, yeah, we could do that. So um, we're thinking about how we can do that in a way that uh, makes sense so that you can have sort of a, a cohort that will keep living and changing over time. And um, you know, maybe you can interact with them. I'm not really sure yet. So right now we produce claims. I mentioned that. And we have payers. But right now, uh, as a bizarre oversight, uh, claims are not tied to um, to payers, so the, the claims just happen and the payers just exist, but they're not linked together. So that's something that's uh, more or less easily fixed. Uh, multiple private and government payers. So in this, I, I mentioned we have different insurance companies. And so you know we have uh, private insurance, no insurance, Medicaid, Medicare, and uh, dual eligibles. Um, but what we don't have is, so it's just private insurance. It's like one giant monolithic category. We want to have different insurance providers who will cover different things with different explanations of benefits and different claims and different claim responses. And um, people will have different things that are in and out of network. I mentioned that a little uh, in a couple of bullets. So it's like if, I'm, if I have this insurance and it says, you know, this provider is in network, but this pro other provider is not, then the patient's gonna start going, is probably, not always, but probably gonna go to the people who are in network because their insurance will cover it. So that gets to care-seeking behavior. So how do people uh, choose the care that they get? Uh, that's another area we wanna look at. And um, one question I always get asked is because we have these disease modules and it's the standard of care, people ask, well, what about, you know, I, I have this use case where I wanna look at um, you know, there's going to be variable care, so can you do that? So um, that's also a hard problem, but we're looking at um, variable care and, and, and actual, uh, and things like um, what happens if patients don't adhere to their medications? Uh, you know, what would, how would their lab values change and things like that? Um, and then 
something I'm interested in is actually showing um, health disparities and, and modeling that. And, and we have some determinants of health, like um, income and education and socioeconomic access and just race and gender, which are determinants. But there's a whole bunch of other uh, determinants of health uh, and social determinants of health that we want to model. And so you, you would get more and more accurate um, populations. And some of this may not, you might be asking, well, I don't know why I would need that for fire or whatever. But actually, there's a lot of users of the system in public health um, space and the research space who are very interested in that kind of um, data. So it's something that we're, we're also interested in. And to sort of my get off the stage is uh, here's my contact information. Here's the open source uh, repository for Cynthia and the module builder. Uh, I'm here till the end of the conference. So I'm happy to help people walk through the exercises or help you complete them if you'd like, or just answer questions. Um, and you're probably all hungry now because it's lunchtime. But I will stick around for a few minutes to answer questions. <laughs>